Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to Firefly Aerospace's Texas test site just outside of Austin, Texas. Now I've got something very special for you today. I'm gonna to take you guys through the entire facility, check out the Reaver engine behind me, and ask a ton of questions with their CEO, Tom Mercusic. Let's get started. Hey, look at this. Hey, Tom. Hey, nice Tim to meet Dodd, you, Tim. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Awesome, and what are we looking at here? This is our Reaver engine, and it's preparing for the second flight of Alpha. Sweet, this is awesome. So this is the new engine too. Yeah? We just talk to it every day, like, <laughs> just when you lift off, I know it's exciting, but the party's not over yet. <laughs> so. hey, what's, what's different compared to uh, the, the first round, the first batch? This is, this is what, uh, this electrical connector here is what, what uh, we had a failure in that caused the engine to shut down. So this is the power okay. that's going to the main valves that opens, open the engine. Okay. And we had the pins inside this connector fail, which just cut the power off to, okay. to that main valve and the main valve closed. And that's why we, we had that engine shut Lost down power. on the first flight. Yeah. So how do how did you determine already that the, the, the pins kind of had loosened up and everything? Well, we found the whole set of engines. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so we pulled them all out. Uh, engines one, three, and four had perfect pins. Engine two had most of the pins sheared really? inside the connector. Yeah. Wow. And it's very obvious from data too that you, uh, we monitor the current going to the engine and we uh, monitor the, the state of the valve and all that adds up to just simply not getting 28 volts down the line to wow. here. Which, um, Isn't that crazy of all the literally hundreds of thousands of components that can come down to something as simple as that? Yeah, I was just watching the last uh, episode of Firefly, the, the TV series, you should watch that. And the, the last episode, uh, the bounty hunter's there, and he's standing next to Kaylee next to the engine, and he's like, a thousand things, just take one of them away, and the whole thing goes down. Yeah. And I was like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I wish I would have watched that episode a little more closely. <laughs> no, but that was an so, epic attempt, though. I mean, for a, especially for a, a first... Oh, yeah. First Man, but this thing would have gone. It, it just wanted to go. Yeah. I could just feel it. I, I, it's, I, you work with these machines so long, you intuitively feel that rocket was just like for god's sakes let me go already you know so much <laughs> testing so much delays and i was just beautiful hop jumped off the pad oh it yeah. looked it looked very nominal but yeah well, just a simple thing like and it's like good that. that you got to validate even you know your your actual launch pad that the clamps you know all the the umbilicals so many things that you validate on that first attempt that are probably <clears> you know you can simulate them all day long but until you actually command the rocket to let go you know you just don't know how that stuff's gonna go you know yeah, it's a huge accomplishment to do that stuff. And I got, you know, a lot of calls afterwards from people who have done this before who are like, yep, you, you guys are there, you know, and it, you're in a different a different state of existence now by showing that you can yes. do, do that sort of thing. Because you you're right, it's just this incredible uh, symphony of events that have to happen for all that to, yes. to come off um, at the same time. And, and it, was, it was beautiful. It all, everything worked well. My, my fears about the mission really hinged on those hinges and, and the various mechanisms to release right and um so well the, even those big props to, to gnc for you know when three quarter or a quarter of your, your your control authority to be able to keep going straight up after that you know 15 seconds then for the next minute and a half having three engines control the thing still yeah i heard impressive. i heard the call out for engine two out uh, and, and you know and it's just like take a step back from yeah. the screen you know yeah, yeah. and uh then yeah you know, like 15 seconds later i'm like sure we just don't have we're just not missing some data here because man it looks pretty good you yeah know? and but then you see it starting to slow down and and it, it kind of all adds up but yeah the control part is is definitely impressive and and you know based on that flight i'm i'm pretty certain we have engine out capability if it's at the right time in the trajectory now popping through that max q you know right. when things get really squirrely no right but on the other side of max q um we should have the ability to to lose an engine um and complete missions which is right. a good good you know resiliency redundancy Definitely. type of thing yeah do you think if you had uh I mean, it wouldn't have mattered anyway because, you know, obviously you wouldn't yeah. have had the, the velocity to, to make it. Yeah. But do you think it would have maintained control if you had two axis gimbals? Cause you are, and you guys are still sticking with your one axis gimbal. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, it's, 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 it's possible. I, I don't know. But yeah. Yeah, it's a real simplification to have a single axis gimbal, one TVC actuator. And we're all about simplicity, yep. about lowering cost. And you got to be serious about that. Yeah. You, you don't just... Uh, 
have nice to have things when your mantra yeah. is, you know, changing the paradigm. Right. So yeah, with single axis gimbal and four engines, you effectively have one big engine. Yep. You have those two axis control and and it showed that, you know, yeah. with one out that even with yeah. the single axis gimbal for a large part of the trajectory, it, it was okay. On the, the uh, RD-170, I think also is single axis on its four chambers. And yeah, you yeah. can basically do everything <clears throat> on yeah. those, you know. Yeah, you know, I spent a, a lot of time a few years ago climbing around under Soviet rockets and, and, and looking at things and getting inspiration from that. And really the four engine configuration and the single axis gimbal yep. comes exactly from that. Yep. Uh, this turbo pump, you know, we worked with our Ukrainian partners. I had a group of about 200 people working at Ukraine at one point, and they helped us design this turbo pump. So yep. this is a really unique machine. This is the first time there's ever been a real combination of, uh, you know, uh, Soviet uh, heritage technology mm -hmm. and American heritage technology. Like this thrust chamber is space shuttle main engine heritage with this uh, copper nickel plated chamber. And there's a lot of uh, know-how and heritage from Soviet rocket engines inside this turbo pump. Really? So it's, this is a totally unique experiment to, to bring, you know, the east and west together in, in one engine design. Because now you're talking my language. I don't, I've been working for two years on uh, an entire family tree of every Soviet rocket engine and the history, like, you know, how they're all connected because it, yeah. it all stems, you know, of, well, eventually it gets back to the A4, but, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's been really fun to just trace even the, the inner lineage of, you know, turbo pumps and this led to this and, um, so that kind of brings up a question for me with, with your, with a fixed throttle, does that mean you can't actually throttle down at max Q or anything? Is it, or is it full bore once it's running, it's just running, or do you have a way of, of throttling beyond that? Yeah, right now it's full bore once it's running, it's, it, it's running, but, um, you know, we can put that variable element in there. We have, have it for, we're planning to use on an upper stage engine, uh, So you don't to actually be able to throttle, throttle down at max Q like most <clears throat> rockets tend to, like that thrust bucket or whatever, where they, you know? No, we just have it designed to run at about six G's at shutdown. I mean, there's some subtle things we can do. We can actually adjust the tank pressure, and that'll mm. give us a little bit of, of throttling if we uh, right. lower the, uh, the the propellant tank pressure. But um, when well, you proved yeah. your fuselage can handle high G <laughs> loads, I mean, holy cow! Yeah, wow. Um, so, uh, what's your what's your combustion ratio inside the main combustion chamber, or your your fuel oxidizer ratio? Sorry. Yeah, about two point three. But the, the, the magic and the, what we have the patent on happens inside the head end of the engine here. We call the tap-off manifold. The okay. way we extract that, that gas um, and, and the whole environment that we extract it in and how it, that is um, coupled with the topology of the flow around the injector all plays into to how we do this. And I can tell you this is the only tap-off engine ever where we don't have to cool the exhaust, the gas coming out of the chamber. Usually you have to dump like hydrogen or, or, yep. or some diluent uh, fuel in to get that, yep. that temperature down because it's 6,000 Fahrenheit inside there. Yeah. This turbine can only take 12, 1,300 Fahrenheit. Oh my God. So you got to make sure that that 6,000 isn't going out here and we've designed it all so that we don't have to put a drop of fuel in it. We just, uh, and so you're burning, you know, with that 2.3 OF, that's not stoichiometric, but it's, right. it's, a, it's pretty it, optimal, it's for, optimal for ISP. Yep. Um, so all that combustion takes place in that environment where you get, you know, good complete combustion with very little soot. Very important. Right. With you look the turbine, at a, okay, yeah. as compared to a GG, you're like running that thing at 0.3 OF and it's just puking out like yeah, a just, big like yeah. steam engine from the 1800s. Yeah. You know, black <laughs> char uh, clogging up turbine nozzles and all that. This is extracting it, you know, all that gas from the, you know, the uh, combustion chamber yeah. where you're producing a lot, lot, of, lot less of that sort of stuff. We've never had um, to any degradation of the turbine system, no turbine nozzle uh, plugging, no coking. Um, these, we've never blown up one of these engines, never. Oh my I mean, gosh. And, and out of thousands and thousands of seconds of development and everything, they just run. And hopefully today won't be the day. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Is there some water out here? Right. <laughs> so, so, you're, so you don't even do a, a helium or nitrogen spin start or anything to... Yeah, we do, we do a nitrogen spin start uh, from the ground. Oh, um, right. Although we've um, recently did a, a, a series of tests where we're trying to figure out how low we can go on that, that spin start. <laughs> mm. Before it can bootstrap uh, um, so, itself, kind of? Yeah, before it'll bootstrap itself. So we've definitely been playing with uh, the 
level of, of spin start that's required, but we do okay. spin start them. But it doesn't. Is that okay. <laughs> on, <laughs> but on the ground side, it doesn't necessarily matter, right? I mean, you can force, you can have a tank the size of a yeah. semi truck on the ground side. Yeah. But in the air, for lightning, I assume it probably matters a lot more. Yeah, exactly for lightning. And uh, yeah, what we found that we is we can probably just tickle this thing with a little nitrogen at altitude and and, and get it to run. Wow. Uh, much lower, uh, very low spin start requirements. Yeah, the dream would be to deadhead start it. Um, but we haven't gotten that brave yet. Okay, I mean, that's still amazing. I, I assumed it, in my head, it has to get like almost all the way up to operating speeds and then yeah. you like, you know, open the valves and let it run, but I yeah. didn't realize you were bootstrapping it yeah. so much. That's yeah. pretty amazing. John, our propulsion director is back there. He's uh, like, uh, hey. I, I've been trying to get him to just plug the throat and then we can like get it running <laughs> and let it blow the throat, up, blow that throat plug out. That, that would do it without spinster <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or blow it up. <laughs> so, so it is regeneratively cooled though yeah. too. Yep. So then that's kind of, uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, like I said, that space shuttle main engine, uh, engine heritage, um, high strength alloy copper with, uh, electroplated nickel, uh, uh, nickel cobalt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, what do you, uh, if you, if it's okay, what do you use for the, uh, the injector? Is it kind of a typical shower head design or is it? Yeah, we have two designs. We have one that we patented called uh, Crossfire, which is a really unique, super simple injector that, that's in the lightning engine. And then on this one, we use a more conventional Pintel injector. Okay. Oh, Pintel. Cool. Yeah. Wow. And now remind me, you could actually throttle with a pintle injector, couldn't you? If you if you wanted to. If you put variable elements in there to throttle it, you can. It makes it a lot more complicated right. to do that. But if you get it to work, then you can also do a phase shutoff on the injector too and get rid of the main valves. Oh, right. So you just so, so that injector throttle becomes the main valve too. Because I think isn't that what the uh, lunar descent engine used was a, a pintle injector to, to be able to handle deep throttling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. Dang. Wow. So um, yeah, we'll. We'll probably get into that uh, with our lunar engines. We'll probably look at for lunar descent engine more of that variable throttling okay. need. You really have that deep throttling need, or you got to use a, a bunch of um, smaller thrusters to yeah. and pulsing. Yeah, and thrust uh, differential. Yeah, and to, like to get you know to kind of average out to whatever thrust you need at the time. Wow. Uh, but the more elegant way is to just deep throttle uh, a pintle, yeah. and so I think we'll get into that. Um, for, for Blue Ghost, is yeah, that, for Blue Ghost, yeah, cool. That's and Blue Ghost is that going to be? Uh, is that is that going to be pressure? I assume it's going to be pressure fed, right? Yeah, Blue Ghost is pressure fed. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, space engines make sense for yeah. that kind of mission to make yeah. them pressure fed. Yeah. And use hypergolics, I assume. Yeah. Or? And the other reason you do pressure fed is because you usually get into those pulsing applications, right. and, and you're not going to be spooling a turbo pump and shutting it <laughs> yeah, off in yeah. 100 milliseconds right, <laughs> it's a right. hard on the hardware <laughs> yeah <a> little <laughs> little yeah that's awesome man this is uh so when you guys you guys have run all four engines at the same time on the same test stand before yeah. correct yeah this this stand has a lot of heritage this was actually set up for the aerospike so you can see that there are 12 <sighs> pads rest in peace yeah <laughs> this each one of these pads was a combustion chamber the for the aerospike, yeah. Really? 12, 12 combustors. So yeah. aerospikes are my other, besides Soviet yeah. engines, aerospikes are my other, uh, yeah. uh, they're the, you know, the devil's engine, obviously, you know, tempting, but, but never seems to be, to be worth it. But you guys got pretty far in development though. Yeah. I mean, our, <clears throat> my opinion is that they're optimal for a pressure fed rocket. So if you remember the in Firefly space systems, we were developing a, a carbon fiber pressure fed rocket and, um, let me get technical. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, uh, your <clears throat> your specific impulse is all about thrust coefficient and how, you know, and that comes down to how much nozzle you mm -hmm. can put on the engine. So you can only expand the gas so far before the pressure becomes so low that the atmosphere starts to, to come in and, and yep. destroy the flow, flow pattern. Yep, you have so, flow separation at the nozzle. Yeah, so you yep. want to make it as long, long, as, as, long as you can. Um, another way to get a longer nozzle is to increase the chamber pressure yep. so that you can kind of forestall that that place where it crosses over to atmosphere further and further out. Yep. So on a pressure fed rocket to get that chamber pressure, you have to pay for it in the pressure of the yeah. tanks, which means thicker tanks, thicker, thicker tanks. So you're in the pressure fed rocket. You're really trying to lower the pressure in the propellant tanks, mm -hmm. but that means you can have a really short nozzle. Yes. 
for the reasons I just said, because yep. the chamber pressure is very low. Yep. Um, the way around that is the aerospike. aerospike. So the aerospike allows you to have increased thrust coefficient by giving you a sort of a virtual nozzle yep. extension um, so that you can use short nozzles on your combustion chamber and then have that additional expansion the, and thrust generation on the spike. Get the long expansion ratio that you can use at sea level is yep. obviously like the whole beauty of aerospike. Yep. Yeah. But it really allows the pressure fed rocket to get the thrust coefficient it needs to be viable huh. at the end of the day. I don't think the pressure fed rocket for orbital launch is viable without an aerospike. Really? Now, when you get some Ukrainian friends and you get turbo machinery <laughs> and you can just go up on pressure, yeah. it's, um, it's less attractive. It's not, not as necessary. Uh, it's easier to go with a more conventional type nozzle. Okay, yeah, was that, was that, what was the final death for you with the, with the aerospike? What was the final thing that closed or you just go, you know, was it the fact that you kind of got your hands on some on turbo machinery and, and people like were willing to design turbo pumps? Yeah, it was really just, we would have kept on going and flown Aerospike with Firefly Space Systems if we hadn't run out of money and shut down and all, and all that. So when we got the new investor, uh, Max Polyakov, uh, he's Ukrainian, he has, uh, his, uh, he has heritage of, in the family of uh, Soviet rocket science and uh, so a lot of connections. So Max was able to connect me in with technical people in Ukraine that could help us with the turbo machinery, which put us years ahead. I mean, that's just, yeah. it's a really hard thing to do. So then if you immediately connect with people with that expertise, it's just like a, a quantum step. Right. Um, so we were immediately able to, to you know, connect our uh, combustion chamber design, to your, your Ukrainian turbo machinery design. And then I decided to take that little bit of extra risk for the, for the big reward and to, to go for it on the tap-off cycle. So that was completely just a firefly call. So um, to connect these two, we decided to go with the most elegant solution, which was tap-off. And yeah. unfortunately it worked. I can tell you the first time we were up in that control room and we ran it and you shut the spin start off and the rocket keeps running, <laughs> it's pretty wild. <laughs> it's I can like, imagine. It's working, this whole principle of operations working. And uh, that was a really exciting day. One of my most exciting days here, I'd say, is just very gratifying to see the the science work the risk to you know pay off and yep. to like we guys we just did something no one in the world has ever done with you know locks rp propellants run a tap off cycle rocket engine that's designed for orbital space flight yep. so yep. make history out here and out in the field is pretty amazing day. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. so um so tell me is there actually any heritage Hold on one second. do you guys need to work on something we, I can, we can step yeah, back yeah, a little bit. Well, you guys, trying you guys to get work. ready to actually fire this thing yeah, up, yeah. and we yeah. don't want to be here when that happens. We'll, yeah. we'll give them room to do that. Yeah. Um, is, there, uh, is there anything that, uh, as far as uh, the, the turbo pump in Ukrainian heritage, is there any actual heritage from other uh, you know, Soviet era engines at all that you know of, as far as like actual, is like that turbo pump similar to, you know, I don't know, something like an RD-264 or something like that or? Yeah, the, this, I mean, that pump is 100% clean sheet designed. Okay. But the Ukrainian team, they're very process oriented and, and they just have a lot of design rules and, um, and methods that they use and just basic construction methods that are different than what we do. For example, the oxygen pump and the fuel pump in this engine are separate on their own. They're uh, coupled, they have a shaft coupler that couples the two, but you can actually remove them individually because over there they like to test them individually, do flow tests with them, and then assemble them, them into to one device. So that's something that's, that so I haven't seen before. it's a single shaft, but it's a, it has a linkage that you can like break it apart and... Yeah, it's like, it's a shaft with like, uh, yeah, a collar that couples the two shafts together. Cool. And uh, when we look at it, it's like, wow, man, that's gonna have to be really tight tolerance to make sure that power gets transferred right. And yep. it doesn't, but you know, these are things that they learned over the years how to do. Um, and we were, you know, benefited from that. You guys aren't putting dents in the nozzle now. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> now the pressure's on. Yeah, we're all nervous these days. <laughs> that one's gonna fly. This fly too. This thing's gotta work. I haven't done that in a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. It's, it's just the whole world will see it now. No big deal. <laughs> we will cut that out. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, that's awesome though. But uh, so with the. Uh, did, and obviously the, the Soviets have a lot of, uh, a lot of, or the Soviets had a lot of experience with uh, having really high temperatures at their turbine too. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that a, was a pretty big limiting factor. Obviously, you know, you, you had to figure out how to cool it enough to have yeah. the turbine survive, but was there some heritage there that you're like, hey, this, this turbine that, that they designed can handle 
higher than you know what other companies are, are maybe operating at? Yeah, I, I'm not so sure they have higher turbine temperatures than we do. They generally do um, full stage combustion engines, so they have hot oxygen. Yes. You know, I, I'm not sure oxygen the absolute rich. temperature isn't is is higher. It's just oh, the fact it's just... that it's 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 very reactive hot gas gotcha. as opposed to inert hot gas. I mean, the temperature is really um, limited by the rotor dynamics and the materials okay. and the materials are you know in canal and uh, the rotor dynamics are, are just a disc rotating right so um, I don't I don't think there's anything okay uh, necessarily different it, this the turbine wheel in this engine looks very similar to to turbine wheels I've seen so in, it's in more about American the, rocket the, engines. the metallurgy and, and the fact that it has to handle the oxygen rich environment as opposed yes. to the actual and yeah. temperature yeah that's where i mean if you want to go to the next level of complexity when you start getting into oxygen rich stage combustion i mean uh, oxygen's liquid oxygen super friendly i mean it's hard to get it to do anything bad um, i've even had not here but in other places i've had um, multiple engines where the liquid oxygen caught aluminum pieces of the engine on fire and the the liquid oxygen just cools it and quenches it and puts it out it's like, oh, really? sorry about that. You know, there's didn't mean to cut your engine on fire. I put it out. It's no big deal. When you get into hot oxygen, gaseous oxygen, yeah. white flash of light, engine's gone. I mean, it's just like gone. This is like consumes it. You know, you're like, what the hell just happened? You know, it's, wow. it's a completely different problem, which required um, many years and extreme amounts of money to solve the, the problem of coating the materials in the environment to be able to deal with that with that uh, oxrich environment now here in america in the last decade or so we've come up with metallurgy that doesn't require these these advanced coatings so we in principle can build uh oxrich stage combustions here that are that are even more robust than than what was done uh, over on the Soviet side. In the 50s already is when they started doing Oxridge, I mean, stage combustion. It's just yeah, they just, they just go for it, you know, get the maximum uh, thermodynamic <laughs> yeah. efficiency you can. So it's, it's always funny to me that they were focusing, while they were focusing on stage combustion, the United States, and, and almost never touching hydrogen, yeah. the United States was doing hydrogen and, and then solid, you know, solid rockets. And that's something that the Soviets almost never ever did, was anything solid. It was all like stage combustion and, and lots of hypergolics, you know. Yeah, 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 major hypergolics. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, they had the SS-18 Satan missiles, which really caused <clears throat> us big problems and was part of a lot of the negotiations that during the Reagan, Reagan era. Yeah, those, those vehicles could sit uh, underground for 20 years. That's what they're designed to. Yeah. Put it in the ground 20 years, don't touch it, liquid fuel rocket system. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, that thing under the tarp is uh, really the world's largest brazing oven for rocket engines. There are two of them in the world. One is there, and the other one is um, building the RD-180s in, in, in Russia. Uh, this was used by Aerojet Rocketdyne, but we acquired it last year and, um, and are setting it up our own facility. So we'll be able to advance our engine um, fabrication tech and move away from nickel-plated chambers to brazed uh, steel wall chambers. Oh, wow. OK. That's cool. Yeah. So the, so the mm -hmm. Reaver and, and Lightning will already be evolving beyond what we see today. Oh, definitely. Yeah, let's go up here. We can maybe get a bird's eye view. So this is our machine shop. And one thing we're doing at Firefly that um, I don't know how unique it is, but we're really segregating the company into self-sufficient business units um, in order to just um, make sure everybody has the resources they need to do what they need to do. You know, we're taking out a lot of projects. We're doing lunar landers, uh, alpha rockets, beta rockets, uh, space utility vehicles. So part of doing that is we have to have uh, the discipline to make sure all these projects have the resources they need. So this machine shop, for example, is, is not just going to be like a hey, come in and get your stuff machine. This is being set up as a commercial aerospace machine shop, and they're going to work like that, and we'll even do uh, external jobs for, for other companies. So up here is kind of like where all the office and programmers and such are going to be. But if you go along here, you can look down and see them working on rocket engine parts. You can see, obviously, somebody was working on a combustion chamber. Wow, a lot yeah, of copper. A lot of copper. It's probably uh, one down on one of these machines we can look at. There's one over by that bin. 
Yep, you can see that was recently machined. Chamber over there. Yep. That's awesome. These DMG machines are really advanced five axis machines with multi pallet tool chambers. Like you can see that machine that's closest to us mm -hmm. on the right has three pallets. So you put three pieces of material there yep. and then give the machine the program and it knocks out three parts without, uh, you know, lights out without well, human without interruption. Yeah, just out, interruption. Yep. Just boom, boom, boom. Um, and right here you can see some Reaver tap off manifolds being machined. Oh, yeah. Those are ink and L parts. Wow. Now we're really getting into uh, 3D printing those in the future, but for the time being we're doing some uh, just by uh, working with ink and L forgings, which hogging out <laughs> ink and L <laughs> forgings is, uh, oh, it, it, that's kind of, yeah, it's tough. In <laughs> ink and L, the, the harder you push on it, the harder it pushes back. It works harder than as you're machining it. So it's, it's the donkeys of... Uh, of, of metal. Exactly, like, that's a good way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harder, no. <laughs> uh, but we're adding a lot of machines here. Uh, we just hired a new machine shop manager that has experience in mass production of combustion chambers. So we're gonna be following his guidance to buy some really uh, kick-ass new machine tools that allow us to you know, machine these thrust chambers in you know a matter of hours instead of days like it takes now. Wow. Wow. But over on the right, we'll walk down on the floor, but on the right you can see how the thrust chambers start. They start as a forging, just kind of a rough shape, that copper thing on the floor. Yeah. It's kind of a rough shape. And then we'll go down and you'll see how that gets turned down. So I think we start with about 1,200 pounds of material. Wow. Um, and then it's, by the time it's done, it's about 80 pounds, I think. <laughs> oh my so, God. So, yeah, that's one thing we want to, you know, we look really closely at additive and, you know, when you think about those material, how much material you're removing, mm -hmm. looking closely at additive, but, you know, on these sizes and guaranteeing that you have, you have the material properties you need in a, in a printing process, we just, we just haven't found that um, combination yet. And we haven't found it being uh, economical, um, even though potentially in, a, in an additive process, you could use less material. At the end of the day, if the part costs more, right, it's like, why? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so really I think 3D printing for some smaller parts has, has been proven really, really beneficial for us. And probably in the prototyping us. phase is prototyping, fantastic. You got it, exactly. That's, yeah, if you want to make something fast and try a bunch of different uh, permutations and iterations, it's, uh, the way to go, but for large scale things like thrust chambers yet, I just haven't seen it. Yeah. Wow, you guys have a lot of space. You're looking to be expanding like crazy, aren't you? Yeah, like I said, I'm really serious about this machine shop becoming a commercial shop, so I'm wow. giving them all the space and offices and stuff they need. But you'll have, um, you know, people doing pricing, you'll have people ordering materials, you'll have people managing tooling, and then the programming of all the machines, it's, it takes you know, quite a few people. Did you guys see a pretty big surge um, after your first flight attempt of people, new hires and, and just a, a lot more excitement around the company? There's definitely energizing the company. I mean, my whole mantra, the corporate culture I want is accomplishing great things and having fun along the way. So every time you accomplish something bigger and bigger, it just, uh, kind of motivates you more and empowers people more. So I think we're definitely got, you know, a little more swagger. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're still not, we're still humble because, you know, the, <laughs> the rocket's always humbling you. But uh, uh, yeah, definitely people just, we're hungry. We're, we're pissed off and we want to get back to the launch <laughs> pad. <laughs> you know, uh, at least I am. <laughs> oh, but it's, I mean, that, uh, again, you validated so many things for a first launch attempt that it has to feel, at least you know you're on the right, you're right direction in, uh, yeah. And you know you got it coming next. You yeah, know? you know, the rocket, I've always, as I said before the launch, I have complete confidence. The rocket's designed well, and there's nothing in that first launch that tells us we have to change anything right. except move some connectors around, things like that. Yep. Yep. That's, yeah, that's great. Yeah. What is your timeline for the next launch? We'll be ready in December. Um, 
we've got regulatory stuff. We got to get through our investigation, uh, get final buy off from the FAA. We might do a uh, slightly different trajectory. So there's some updates. But yeah, I was surprised. I didn't realize until literally like the day before launch that you guys were flying so retrograde. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was that? What was the purpose of, of that as opposed to a little more polar? Uh, scary new rocket. <laughs> Get it away from land. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't realize that. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, you're just trying to get to orbit. You're not trying to. Yeah, we're trying to do it was a test test flight. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when the thing's going next time, it'll be over Hawaii in like 15 minutes after launch, which is pretty pretty wild. Wow. Yeah. That is. Let's That's see crazy. if we got any. any uh, no, I don't think we have any. No thrust chambers up today? <laughs> no, not today. Yeah. There's that one that's over there that I did. But Here's one of these turbine wheels if you want to look at it. Yeah, you can take a picture of that. It's okay. It's just pretty standard. Wow. So that's rotating about 33,000 RPM inside wow. the engine. And that, so that obviously has to be extremely precise and extremely well balanced. Extremely well balanced. But uh, what's amazing is, that, you know, 900 horsepower you get out of that out of that turbine wheel to drive the pumps. So just the pump to pump the propellant's 900 yeah. horsepower. It's pretty cool. And I love that uh, the the little buckets, you know, the little the little buckets that catch gas. It's it's pretty crazy that uh, yeah. that they can handle those kind of forces and that kind of pressure and temperature yeah. and everything. Yeah, I mean you're converting the kinetic energy of that gas into the kinetic energy of this guy. Yeah, like you said, oh, it's a it. bucket. It just catches it and yep. turns it. This guy goes faster. The gas goes slower. So that's awesome. That's awesome. So that's very cool. This is Brett. He's uh, hey. one of our. Uh, you, you were great, man. I really hey, enjoyed thank you. that. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, I really enjoyed your launch. That was <laughs> amazing. We really, uh, I was, I was just so excited about it. Honestly, Here's, wait for the next one. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are gonna knock it out of the park in the next one. I know it. Yep. I know it. <laughs> is there, is there some kind of a De Lavelle nozzle that that uh, that exchanges the pressure? into higher velocity uh, at the turbine, like before the turbine? Exchanges the pressure and higher velocity. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. The so they're, 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 the tap off gas comes in uh, to a De Laval nozzle. Um, it's pretty interesting geometry. I don't know if we have one around here, but it's, it's a scarfed nozzle, if you've seen. Um, if you take a normal nozzle and you just cut part of it off, yeah. it, that's called a scarfed nozzle. So huh. it's kind of like half of a nozzle. Really? Yeah, it uh, expands in there. And, um, so there you, you take uh, the pressure from the, the tap off, which is about uh, 1100 PSI, you expand it through a nozzle to about 30 PSI. What, 1100 PSI is coming off that tap off? Yeah, it's coming right out of the combustion chamber. The combustion chamber runs up to 1300 PSI. Really? So what, sorry, what's that in bar? That's almost all, like 80, 90? It's, it's about 90 bar, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, that's higher than I thought, considering it's, you know, I always assumed that it, you had to have, you no, know. We, we, can, we can do anything with the tap off that you can do with the gas generator really? and, and probably more efficiently, yeah. So you're moving we, a lot of parts. We're, we're moving up, uh, I mean, 1300 PSI for kind of first generation engines, pretty, pretty sporty, pretty yeah. good. It's a lot higher than uh, engine programs I worked on for other companies. <laughs> yeah. For first, first. Do you first actually shot. think you can get beyond that? And Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the technology, the, like I said, that space shuttle main engine technology, that could go to 3,000 PSI chamber pressure. Now, um, it's not smart to do that with an open cycle engine, but it um, has to do with the turbine efficiency, pressure ratio across the turbine. That 1,200, 1,300 is about optimal. Uh, also, with LOX RP propellants, it, some of the uh, products that condense on the surface of the chamber are beneficial for uh, for inhibiting heat transfer to the wall. Oh, right. um, so once you get up about above about 1200 PSI, that sort of soot carbon layer starts to come off. So it kind of runs away. Your, your, your um, cooling problems get worse very kind of precipitously as you go over yeah. that mark. It's so not just 100 PSI is a little bit different because your soot goes away and now you've got much more heat transfer to the wall. So there are other factors that play into What's going on in so, there? So the coking on the combustion chamber can almost aid as like a as an insulating barrier. Oh, it absolutely does. It's a really? big. It, it it's really effective thermal barrier coating for free. Oh, really? So all that soot you saw in my face and in that chamber, that's 
great for thermal barrier coating. I didn't know that. transfer. I never thought about that. But if you go to too high OF or you go to too high pressure, that goes away and it's just pure copper, like, you know, exposed. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Wow. Which is a unique part of the Lox RP engine. And Lox RP is amazing for a boost propellant. Frankly, I don't know why anyone would use anything other than Lox RP for, for boost propellant. Um, certainly for upper stages, higher energy propellants are better. But when you look at the um, impulse density, as you call it, or you know how much impulse you get per unit volume, it's on par with with anything out there. Yeah. You know, methane, yeah. better performance, but bigger tanks, and it all kind of washes out to be equal. But then you got all the hassles of lower explosion limits and handling cryo that stuff and, and cryo. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's like, it's pretty bizarre when you think about Rockefeller and those guys were like making kerosene back in the 1890s and it's the absolute perfect thing to go to space <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> after all these years that's crazy yeah that's awesome <laughs> huh so and with um do you guys do any additional like film cooling at all like um on the injectors or anything to because that's another way of cooling the combustion cooling the combustion chamber too is uh, an additional layer of a uh, fuel or something right that yeah kind of we found that we can run the barrels you know without any film cooling at all um which is another thing that cranks up efficiency. Um, on some engines, we've early on, we put um, film cooling in the throat area, because that's where you get scariest. That's the highest heat flux is there. Um, but we've had engines we run without film cooling, eventually no film cooling, but the early ones, you know, were more conservative, have uh, film cooling in them. Also, like that first flight of Alpha, the engines ran at 2.2 OF, you know, which is just a more conservative, cooler, running uh, combustion temperatures, but then we'll just incrementally march up. You know, we've run these engines at 2.4, 2.5 OF and, and haven't had anything crazy happen yet. How, how do you cool it, just the throat? Where, do you have to inject a separate place to inject uh, fuel or, or something to, at, at a throat? I never understood that. Yeah, so I um, wish we had a chamber here with uh, cooling channels in it. So that chamber will have cooling channels milled into it yep and then it will we'll put wax in those channels and then we'll electroplate nickel over that and then we'll melt the wax out and now you've got channels that's how we make our cooling channels okay now before you put the wax on when you have those channels if you just go a little bit above the throat and use an edm about you know uh, 12 mil edm tool electro discharge machining wire and just pop little holes through those cooling channels into the chamber oh. before you plate it now you, you plate it, and in those channels you have little tiny holes, an array of little tiny holes above the converging section, and that will inject jets of cold fuel. So basically, like intentionally will leak a little bit of cold fuel. Intentionally leaks exactly. Interesting. Yeah. And I've even seen these engines are amazing. I'm not, I haven't seen this here as much, but I've seen places where the engine will actually erode itself down to the point where it starts leaking, and then it's happy, and it doesn't go any further. It just like self-regulates. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Almost like an ablative nozzle unintentionally, but self correct yeah, it reaches an equilibrium and it doesn't blow up, it doesn't go away, it just kind of erodes back so that the wall's thin enough to get the heat transfer and sometimes it leaks too and, and that's off you crazy. go. Yeah. So, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, the space shuttle guys did us good getting, uh, getting the stuff working. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 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 Okay, Mile covered with a No, you're good. I've been touching my face again. <laughs> Working man. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. One forty five. I don't maybe this wasn't supposed to be a propulsion interview, but <laughs> I, say I, I like to get involved in that stuff. Well, that's and that's I love all the little little, little uh, you know nitty gritty gritty details like this. You know, especially yeah. when I get to talk to someone that. It knows what they're talking about. I'm going to pick your brain mm -hmm. all day. You know, this is this is fun stuff for me, and and my audience in particular, I think, tends to really like, you know, getting into these things that they don't get to hear about all the time. You know. Yeah. And, and unique solutions. I love that every different company, every different engineer will have, you know, tackle a, a, the same problem with a different solution. Um, and it's just cool to see you guys using the, the tap off like that. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this whole place is kind of like living in a home that you're building around you <laughs> while yeah. you're living in it. If, for people that have done that. So, yeah, a lot of these buildings are catch-all. We're moving a lot of things to Cedar Park. You'll get to see the spacecraft facility. Um, and we're going to move the final integration of the rockets uh, down there soon as well. 
Cool. And um, we're building a huge, like world-class composites facility with robotic auto fiber placement machines. If you see there's dirt moving over there, that's gonna be a big facility, twice as tall as these buildings, twice as big. Um, and so we have this amazing uh, aircraft technology, um, auto fiber placement machines that we're that we've procured and we're going to use to build rockets. That's awesome. Because as you saw, all this stuff is wow. is hand built up by hand. Wow, this is bigger than I thought yeah. to be honest. Just being up close and yeah, this is just the lock tank. This is just the liquid oxygen tank for first stage. And again, and you have no liners or anything. It's just straight on. No, nope, we have no straight up. Yeah, the technology of how we figured out how to put domes and stuff in here was really hard, but it's one of our innovations. Yeah, that's my understanding. It's pretty darn hard to keep locks happy in a pure locks like that happy in a carbon fiber environment can be pretty, pretty difficult. Yeah. But it's, it's like I said, a locks is pretty well behaved from a reactivity perspective. Uh, we have never had any problems with any of this stuff catching on fire. So here's uh, flight two going together. I think that was flight three that we passed. So this is flight two, getting ready to integrate engines. That engine that's out there testing will be integrated on here. But you can wow. see the whole first stage assembly, fuel, inner tank, oxygen. That's amazing. So the team's trying to convince me to paint something fancy on the, the bottom here. We had the, the, the uh, Phoenix yep. on the first one to kind of represent, you know, just the resilience of the company, you know, uh, having setbacks, bouncing back, coming back to life. Rising from the ashes. Rising from the ashes, yep. all that. And uh, so I wanted to keep the second flight pretty simple, a help, you can see. <laughs> but now they're, they're talking about putting some, like, highly decorative Phoenix on it or something. So we'll see what they come <laughs> up with. <laughs> so Composites is working on, like, flight five, I think. All these tanks over here Jeez. so yeah, you guys are cranking these they're they're, yeah, they're they're serious about making that flight right next next year so by by the end of next year we'll have one of have flown five more rockets wow. so we're we're confident in the design so we're building it and yeah going ahead yeah this, this is probably the one you flight two fairing And you guys did something a little different for your... Yeah, you can see them making the COPVs over here. Sorry. What? Yeah, you're good. Yeah. Uh, for your first flight, you went ahead and, and kind of certified and, and did a, a lot more steps that would be unusual for a first flight. If I recall, you were certified and ready for flight uh, by doing all the cataloging and everything that you'd normally do for a customer. Is that correct? I feel like there's maybe some extra steps you guys did even on your first flight that'd be... Yeah, the, the scrutiny that you undergo at a range like the 30th is totally different, for example, in a NASA range, where you're basically following uh, industry standards and OSHA and things like that. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the 30th and the 45th, at the Air Force you know, ranges, you're following that whole regimen that ULA and all the heritage companies have to follow. And, you know, I, we, we, we purposefully did that. You know, we didn't want to just like go to Alaska and just start blowing up stuff, you know. Uh, we want to, I, I really feel like the the rigor that went into getting everything right for the range translates into quality assurance, really, that's just going to make uh, the product mature faster mm -hmm. than just running out there with, you know, stuff duct taped together and, and trying to see what it does. Yeah. So, that's interesting. Are we doing a Q? <laughs> that's our new uh, cubicle uh, COPV. <laughs> Uh, I may have to, uh, that may be an intern project. I may have to have a conversation with them about <laughs> pressure vessels. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> That's cool. That's funny. That's funny. Someone just trying to strengthen the shoebox for fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're building up all of our area assembly areas we're getting new buildings and stuff there's just so much stuff crammed in here these guys are building valves yeah. they're building composites over here building engines over uh, plumbing over here so they have uh, they have template engines so they're building all the fluid lines oh, so these cool. are just like uh, 
like when you're making dresses, like pattern, you know, right, pattern, pattern dummies. Yeah. yeah. So they can come up here and double fit, check all the fit and, and double, everything. yeah, double check and weld stuff up. That's awesome. And we can walk through here. Yeah, we may um, we may edit some of your video here on some of these tools are kind of proprietary. Gotcha. But, so building the composites, you need to do it in this uh, clean and, and cool environment. Uh, but it it's really arts and arts and crafts at this point. Um, you have these tools, fairing tools, dome tools, barrel tools, and it's folks in here uh, laying out patterns one at a time. We have a, a laser projection system that we use for a lot of these uh, operations where it'll project the pattern oh, cool. onto, and, and all they have to do is lay it up, lay it up, lay it up, just follow the, just all follow the it and say go, and it puts the next laser thing up. This fairing is one that we don't have programmed in there, but uh, some of the other parts we do. So it's almost like a paint your own, paint by code, but it's a fairing, or like carbon layup by, by number. Yeah, it'll actually put the number, laser project like that, no way. Up there and with the exact shape. Huh. And you just stick it right where the way, you know, the, it'll have the outline up there. You just stick it right there. That's crazy. And wipe it down, peel, peel it off, and, and then just say go, and it just moves around. That's insane. Yeah. But when we get the auto fiber placement machine, it'll just go in here robotically and, and lay all this stuff up. It can move like 15 miles per hour, this head of, um, it's called a... Uh, uh, Toe. It's a uni, unidirectional toe. So this stuff is all fabric. It's like woven fabric. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, you can't really see it there, but it's, it's like woven fabric. Uh, the stuff that goes in the auto fiber placement machine is unidirectional. So the benefit of that is, is it can align the fibers exactly in the direction of the force. The loads, yeah. yeah instead of, with the fabric, the, the 90 degree one goes along for the ride, right? Because it's right. fabric. Right. So often you do them 45 to where the load is. But with the uni, you can just line it right with, with the load and, and get an even more efficient structure than you can with the fabric. Wow. So it's fast, lower cost, weight savings, optimal, supply chains established. They build 777s with this technology. Just write a $10 million check and you get, get one. Sweet. <laughs> Where do I sign up? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then so for the fabric, it's, it just comes in rolls like this rolls out here and this table cuts those a CNC cuts those patterns. Wow, that is cool. That'd be fun to be the person that has to design all the shapes and know especially with the fairing where it's a little more contoured, you have a little more, you know, unique shapes and stuff. It'd be it'd be fun to have to figure out, you know, how to do that as efficiently as possible. Well, uh, we have a partnership with with Siemens and uh, they make um, NX and team center and they have some other um, fiber carbon fiber dedicated tools that do exactly that and the cool thing is it helps you lay it all out when you're designing it and then it takes all that layout and takes it to the environment where you can do the stress calculations directly and then it can export these patterns for you and then it can program that laser like all for in one so you just do one model and from there on, it just does all this other stuff automatically. Wow. This automation. That's, we're just getting into that. That's going to be a really cool uh, upgrade next year. That's awesome. So there's some other tricky things that you have to do. Like, um, so our tool is not long enough to do the entire liquid oxygen tank. So we have to actually splice multiple sections, sections together. And they're multi-millions of pounds of force when this thing's pressurized that are trying to rip this million. I mean, like millions of pounds, okay? So, and there's liquid oxygen inside of here, so not, nothing can crack. So getting this joint to work was a, um, was a technical challenge for us, and, and they uh, figured it out. Uh, wow. But we've, in, we've ordered a tool that's long enough to do the whole thing now, so, so it'll eliminate that, step, eliminate that step. But that's cool. that, was, that was a big technical achievement. And then getting the... Um, you know, how do you seal these tanks out? Uh, we found a way to do it completely with carbon fiber. So there's no metallic, you'll see there's no metallic joints here whatsoever, which is important in the cryogenic 
uh, for the cryogenics because one of your big problems is differential thermal expansion. Right. Everything gets cold, the, the stainless steel or whatever is like, I'm cold, and the yeah. carbon's like, I don't feel anything, you know, and they and they end up separating. Expand at different rates, yeah. basically. And then right? so then you get cracks and leaks and all that stuff. So wow. we spent a lot of time figuring out how to do almost everything in just carbon without any of those metallic interfaces. Okay. So yeah, we're in the process of building that up. We're gonna get rid of all these trailers. These are my little beautification projects. I'm building <laughs> parks. I'm gonna build another park here when I get rid of this trailer. Awesome. <laughs> Looks like we need to build some parking lots. <laughs> um, Eventually. So in these trailers, in these tents, I have some goodies. Did you see these uh, rocket parts last time you were here? I, I saw the, uh, it was almost like a an H1 or something. It was some weird um, variant of a, not the H2, but it was some other weird engine. Yeah, so that's that engine there. So, the, so this engine was the um, TR, I think we should go look at it. If I remember right, it was like TRW's uh, attempted the J2 maybe? Yeah, you got it. You know, you know exactly what's going on here. Yeah, I just want to make sure to get, I think it was Aerojet's attempt at the J2 and Rocketdyne won with the J2. Um, yeah, I think it says Aerojet on here it somewhere. such a unique engine. Got some, Even got some wasps living in here. This is interesting there. If you can get a picture of that wasp going in there. <laughs> yeah. That's actually, those wasps have caused many of a problem with rocket engines. They're called mud daubers. And what, oh, they, right. and what they do is any little hole, they just find a little hole and they go out, catch some grasshoppers, chop them up, shove them in the hole, uh, get more grasshoppers, shove them in there, go in there, lay some eggs for the babies, and then they seal it with a, a mud seal and fly off and then the babies are born, they have a good snack. But um, many rocket engines, and I, I had this problem when I was running the SpaceX's McGregor site a lot, and I kind of learned my lesson there. Um, we had many of these valves work on the principle of like pressurizing something and then venting it. And if it doesn't vent, then the, the valve, then like a main valve will stay open. So we've had you know, like these mud daubers, unbeknownst to us, will clog like a vent port. And then you go to run the engine and go shut it off and it just keeps going. <laughs> no <laughs> and it's, way. and an engine blows up or something and it's because of it. No, what? how do you avoid that? Do you just purge the everything? They have these time, wonderful or? little um, screens that um, you screw on the fittings, and they just have a screen on them so that the mud so dabber no can't climb in. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I think this was Rock Aerojet's uh, version of the J2 uh, that just never quite made it. So it's a LOX hydrogen Apollo uh, wow. experimental engine. So we're going to clean it up and give it a proper display at some point. It's just in here temporarily. And it looks like it's dual shafted. Yeah. That's cool. Wow. Yeah. Huh. That's crazy. So it's gotta be pretty rare. I feel like there couldn't have been too many of those things made. No, I think it's gotta be pretty unique. It's probably worth a lot of money. It deserves a better home than out here in a tent. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. Yeah. I'll put it on display. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the, the neat thing about working, working with Elon and Jeff is they're both um, really really uh, understood the technology and I always thought it's an important part of these types of companies that at least when you're starting up that the, the leadership can discern you know good ideas from bad ideas <laughs> careful with the sharp edges <laughs> yeah and to, to be able to lead from a position of knowing the technology as opposed to just yeah. kind of always just from the business end of things is probably yeah. very beneficial when it comes to a rocket company. Yeah, and I think if you just look at the various companies that are out there, it, it shows in the results. You know, Peter Beck is really into into the technology and you know they've made a lot of progress quickly. Yep. yep. Are you, uh, now if I recall, so Alpha has no plans on ever being recoverable or anything, right? But that's what beta's for? Yeah, yeah, no immediate plans. I wouldn't rule it out, but really we're focused on beta and the reusable, re reusable parts. Because oh. beta, beta needs to be, you know, really cost competitive on a, on a dollar per kilogram basis. Mm -hmm. Alpha less so because it's, it's, it gives you dedicated mission yep. uh, capability where people are willing to pay more for cost per kilogram. But beta, 
you know, it'll be able to do GTO missions and it needs to be, it needs to be low single digit thousand dollars per kilogram. So awesome. reusability is going to be important. So that's your test stand out there. The two of them, right? That's that stage test stand, then a structural test stand over on the far left. Okay. Behind this telephone pole is the that's quick the... disconnect stand. So that's where okay. we, we practice that. Um, we actually move, simulate the rocket moving up and pull the, pull oh, the cool. QD off so that we get all the dynamics right. And then the little walls you see um, behind those four tanks, that's a component area where we can burst thing, take things to burst and such. Cool. But next up is to build some beta size stuff. Yeah. And there's uh, some beta. You guys are going to be so excited. There's so much going on with beta. Crazy uh, stuff uh, going yeah, on with beta. So <laughs> tell me. Tell I can't me, tell you anything. Can't tell me anything? <laughs> not even, excuse us. <laughs> not even, uh, not even you? if it's going to have the uh, same engines or anything. Um, I just, um, the way the, I think, um, so anyway, this is where we build out of the, the test stands and, and, and such. Well, welding, welding. I don't see anything major going on right now. But uh, the interesting things about beta are going to be, first of all, it's going to fly first, just like alpha flew first. So, you know, relativity and rocket lab, catch me if you can. Um, and, you know, one of the things we'll do, it's not just about technology, it's about business relationships, so I think you'll see some interesting uh, relationships we have with various entity entities to, to uh, bring the beta development along quick, quicker. That's awesome. Um, so here, they're getting ready to run an engine test. So we have three control rooms here. Um, this one we use for the stage testing, uh, this one for engine testing, and then there's one on the other side that's for structural testings. So pretty lightweight operation. You see, it's basically uh, really two people that can run the whole test. There's one engine uh, responsible engineer who's sitting there. So you have you have a test engineer, a test conductor, and then a test director. So the the test um, engineer is is um, I'm sorry, the test conductor is reading off of a procedure that's established that's been run a hundred times, and the test engineers executing the commands to prepare the stand and execute various auto sequences, um, and is also just watching on monitoring the general health of the stand. The test director is representative from the propulsion department, and he or she is carefully monitoring the health of the rocket engine and making sure it's ready to go, or calling an abort if there's an issue in some point. And then if we do have aborts, the, the test director um, looks through the data, adjust the boards and things like that to get ready for the next run. So that's basically wow. how it works. But you can see, looks like they're got everything cleared out since we were out there, ready yeah. to go. So this engine's, uh, uh, this one must have run because it had sit on it, didn't it? Yep. So I thought this one was brand new. But uh, so that's conditioning the stand, letting liquid oxygen uh, go through all the lines leading up to the engine to to make sure everything's cool, take it from the 100 degree uh, Texas sun to, we, not like, we like to run the liquid oxygen about minus 295 degrees Fahrenheit. So it takes a little bit to, to get all that stuff cooled down. So yep. that, uh, thermally, uh, yeah. not shock it. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to put like minus 290 or minus 285, that's hot by like you know, rocket engine standards. And if it gets hot, then it's like a, it capitates. So when those turbo mm. pumps are trying to run at 30,000 RPM, you start getting bubbles uh, right. because the vapor pressure of the, of the liquid oxygen is high because it's warm. So that's really the main reason we try to have to get everything nice and, nice and cold. Wow. <coughs> that's crazy. Now, SpaceX, they take it a step further and they like try to cram more oxygen into the rocket. So they super cool it. So yep. whereas we go to minus 295, I think they're probably running at like minus 320 or something like that. 
Yeah, it's 207, minus 207 centigrade, but I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, you, you're, you've got your European uh, <laughs> yeah. Someone quit. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're a rocket scientist, you'd say ranking. But <laughs> I mean, maybe I would understand. I don't understand Celsius. Kelvin, <laughs> Kelvin and ranking, absolute temperatures. Yep. Yep. Uh, so how far are we away from uh, you guys lighting that, lighting that fire? I don't know. Let's go find out. So this is our lunar landscape. Oh, cool. So this is where we practice, uh, we're really with the real vision navigation systems, uh, practicing our, our landing on the moon, terrain recognition and all that. Got some weeds out there, which we don't expect to encounter <laughs> on the moon. But, um, do you do that with a drone then or something? Yeah, we do with a, a big drone, but it has the actual cameras and the actual software that the, that the lander has on it, so we can practice uh, testing that software. And, yeah. Um, which I'll tell you, it's pretty wild when you're, you're like out there standing in that and you're in the middle of a cow field in Texas, like thinking we're like really figuring out how to land on the moon in the middle of the field. Definitely, <laughs> That's definitely. Cool. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Let me see, so one of these guys ready. Hey guys, when should we head out? Um, I think we'll be good for 2.30. 2.30. Okay. Yeah. Like it. We'll shoot for a hot fire at 2.30. 2.30, okay, so we have 14 minutes. Okay. It's okay. I was hoping to set up, set up a high speed too from yeah. some kind of vantage point. Okay. Well, we got like 15 minutes, so we better go. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's, there, like, it's like looking at welding, kind of like just look over at the, those poles instead of like straight at it because okay. after it's done, it will leave a little hysteresis in your eyes. <laughs> it's not going to, it's not going to hurt you, but right, I mean, right. it's just it's a little bright. Yeah. A little bright. Okay. Cool. So they'll vent and the press. Also, just the act of venting the tank actually cools the liquid oxygen too. It causes it to, in the tank, it causes it to boil. And as it boils, it removes heat from the rest of the bulk liquid. Yeah, thermal, thermodynamics doing their, doing their thing, yeah. right? Yeah, it's called saturation. So it's the same thing we do on the launch pad. We just put the liquid oxygen in. It doesn't really matter what temperature it is. And then we just sit there and you'll notice the boiling rate goes down, 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 down as it self cools. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the other thing you can do is bubble uh, helium, little helium into the liquid oxygen, let it percolate up through the oxygen. And as it does that, there's a, there's a concentration gradient. Uh, nature abhors a gradient of any, any type, not just vacuums. So you got pure helium, oxygen, and the oxygen tries to infiltrate that pure helium, so it evaporates into that. And in the process, it um, releases heat and cools the oxygen, and the helium convects it up and boils it out the top. So that's another way we cool it. It's called, you'll heal, you'll, sometimes you'll hear helium bubbler on or something, and really anybody that's launching rockets, and that's what it is. They, you bubble helium from the bottom and out the top and it cools it. Huh. Kind, of, kind of a weird way to cool, but you know. yeah. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> you okay? That was awesome! Yeah, you get four of those together, it gets really interesting. <laughs> Holy crap, that was so much brighter than I thought. And louder too, that was Got awesome. a little dust coming back toward us too. Holy crap, look at that. <laughs> okay, that was amazing. Cool to go to work and be scared by the things you work on. <laughs> All right, I got to go back to the to, to working on the ring. Awesome. Hey, thank you so you. much for your time. It was really awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to the teams here at Firefly Aerospace for letting me walk around and just check out all this stuff. I love it. And I gotta tell you, that was the closest I've ever been to a rocket engine firing. It's a lot brighter than I thought, and it's pretty stinking loud. That was amazing. So thank you for that.
I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make videos like this and everything else we do here at Everyday Astronaut possible. If you want to help support what I do and gain access to our awesome Discord community or lots of other behind the scenes things, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out our awesome web store like this, the Aerospike shirt, which is fitting considering Firefly was originally trying to do that Aerospike engine or lots of other fun stuff like the rest of our Schematics collection, our future Martian shirt, full flow, lots of fun stuff at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.